Welcome to Global Connections on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today we're going to talk about Iran from a great empire to a rogue state. Can it ever become a good neighbor in the family of nations? Our guest for this show is Rupmati Kandakar, our geopolitical analyst. Welcome to the show, Rupmati. Hello, Ajay. Thank you for having me on your show. Always, always a great pleasure for me. It's so interesting to think about. Iran as Persia, as, uh, as, as part of the empire that was uh, covered by Alexander the Great, which I'd like to ask you about, and uh, all of the um, strange geography and geopolitics that have taken place since then, and where we are now. It, it, whatever you want to say about Iran, it's unique. So let's talk about it. Rupmati, you know, what is, what is the history of Iran? What was it doing when it was Persia? Jay, we, we have always, uh, as lovers of history and uh, what it is, existence, we want to recognize Iran as a part of uh, being Persia. Persia, the great civilization from where, you know, Zoroastrianism, uh, which worshipped fire, came in. Great inventions, great travelers, great, great kings, uh, administration. These are the things that we want to. Uh, discuss, but from what was Persia, when uh, it was uh, conquered by uh, Islam with the sword, by, by force, you know, you have Zoroastrianism uh, disappearing, you have persecution of minorities, you have all these kinds of se setting in, and then we see Persia deteriorate into the Islamic Republic of Iran. Now, it's a theocratic society, uh, which is uh, very, because uh, Persia was known to be a uh, civilization. When you say civilization, Jay, there's a lot of tolerance in the word civilization. It, it respects diversity. It accepts uh, uh, new things. It learns, it develops, it evolves. And uh, right now, what we see Iran is as, as a closed state, uh, uh, you know, uh, suppressing an oppressor state, so, which is suppressing within and outside, as we'll discuss through this program. But uh, it lost the traits of being a great civilization and confined itself to being a theocratic uh, uh, nation state. And that's what causes this problem, Jay, because uh, we know that any, any uh, development uh, happens with respect to change. And today, Iran refuses to change its hardliner policies. And uh, that is where uh, diplomacy takes a back, a back seat. And you have uh, these, uh, uh, what do you say? The biggest uh, memory that uh, we can have of Iran is the 1979 revolution that happened. And you had a, a, a hostages taken, a 14 month hostage uh, ordeal it was. And uh, it bought the Islamic revolution. They thought it would, uh, the Shah was uh, deposed of and you got um, Ayatollah Khomeini as the uh, religious head. Now, he had said that he'll go to Qom, that's a religious place, and take retirement. But other, it happened otherwise. He declared himself to be the religious leader, and uh, consequently, he became the dictator. He was the head of the uh, state. He was head of the, um, uh, what do you say, army, uh, the, everything controlled by one single person who is religious. Um, so, uh, Jay, Iranian politics becomes a very um, confusing state of uh, mixture of religion, uh, ideology, politics, uh, cultural uh, clashes. And Jay, what happens in this for the uh, theocratic state to survive and to uh, thrive, they suppress minorities. They suppress the uh, religious uh, uh, outcries or you know anything that, um, goes against them has to be eliminated. That happens in every uh, society that wants to be a dictatorship or have a hold on its domestic policy. And that has been continuing till to date. Uh, 2022, we have heard splashed through the headlines that there was one Mahasa who was a uh, persecuted 22 year old, I think, was persecuted for not wearing a scarf. And then there was an uprising, which was swiftly uh, taken down by the revolutionary police, they have this kind of uh, a guard which specializes just to suppress any uh, rising against, even a voice against the regime. Their prisons are full. Their prisons are known to be 
very uh, hard for uh, the prisoners. And uh, Jay, there is no appeal kind of a system in Iran. So uh, leaving that aside, Jay, it's the world's biggest sponsor of terrorism. And that's where our problem lies. If a state is doing something within its uh, sovereign borders, it is for the uh, domestic population to uprise and change the regime or, you know, whatever. But what happens is when Iran becomes the biggest sponsor of terrorism, it affects the neighborhood, it affects the region, it affects the world, and it gives a very, um, what do you say, uh, critical view of what Iran has become today. And rightly, like you said, it's come from a civilization to being a rogue state. You know, in 1950 or so, the U.S. created this structure with the Shah of Iran, and he remained in power until 1979 when they threw him out. Um, nobody liked him. He was uh, he was oppressive. He was a dictator himself, um, and he was uh, very mean to his own people. And they were happy to get rid of him. But he was seen as an extension of the U United States. We we propped him up. We created him. We created that whole structure around him. And so uh, you know, with some cause, they they blamed us for him. And then when they got rid of him, and actually he died in the U.S. He had cancer, as I recall. He died in the U.S. in a hospital. So he was in the lap of the United States. And when they had the revolution in 1979, um, they were ticked off at us. And they're still ticked off at us. And, and that's, I guess, what led them to uh, you know, take all those hostages in the American embassy back in 1979 and humiliate Jimmy Carter, who didn't deserve that. He didn't deserve to be humiliated that way. Uh, and, and then when uh, Ronald Reagan uh, took office, almost immediately, Iran uh, let the hostages go. And I never understood exactly why. They were trying to, I suppose, uh, send a message about Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter and and it was very regrettable, actually. And it did not lead to good relations. And we haven't had good relations ever since. Uh, they've, been, uh, they've been our enemy ever since. And they are certainly the enemy of Israel, calling Israel all kinds of horrible names and establishing all these uh, terror proxies all around the, the Middle East. But, you know, the question I was going to ask you, Rupmati, is why? Why did they decide to make themselves a rogue state? We understand theocracy. We understand that theocracy is, is autocracy, you know, garbed by religion. That's what it is. It's the same thing. <clears throat> but we, what I don't understand is why this country, which has 90 million people, and it's the largest country in the region, the most advanced country in the region in many ways, uh, why it would be what it would want to be and continue to be for all these years and 45 years since the revolution. And it remains and continues and gets worse uh, as, a, as a terror organization, um, as a friend of our enemies, um, and as a rogue nation. This is not just overnight. This is a dedication to being rogue. Why would they? Why would these ninety million people want to do that? Jay, uh, in Iran, the peculiar thing is that the domestic people, ninety million people, are different from the ruling elite. And uh, after Khomeini, we have Khomeini who has come into power, and he is now the supreme leader from eighty-nine onwards. And Jay, if you see his uh, speeches, a couple of one, them I'll give you, that on September 16th, he said, if we cannot consider to be Muslims, if we are oblivious to the suffering a Muslim is enduring in Myanmar, Gaza, India, or any other place. Then on September 21st, he says that the Zionist regime is able to commit these crimes because the Islamic Ummah is not rising and giving its inner strength. And he calls the Zionist regime as the evil cancerous tumor from the heart of the Islamic community, namely Palestine, and eradicate U.S. interference in the religion. Now, what you'd see from this, Jay, it's all about uh, becoming the head of the Muslim world. You are trying to bring people under an umbrella of Muslim versus the other. You're trying to target uh, the U.S. and Israel at one point of time. And Jay, when you, uh, when you bring uh, this religious divide on the international community uh, uh, 
on the international stage, you're going to bring the Christians under one umbrella, you're going to bring the Jews under one. So this division that will happen uh, is what Iran wants to, divisive policy, policies that you say. It's uh, a, a nation competes in democratic societies, compete for what? For economy, for development, for advancement in your technology. So all these things are, are they take a back seat. This rhetoric, this religious political rhetoric that Iran indulges in is not only to please uh, the hardliner domestic uh, uh, supporters, but also to the religious countries who would like to uh, believe that they are being oppressed um, imaginatively by the US and who uh, hate uh, Israel. This is the kind of hate um, narrative that they spread, Jay. And Jay, uh, if you know that Israel has one of the second, third largest oil reserves, it's the second largest gas reserve, so they have plenty of uh, petrodollars, like you call it. And uh, um, the US, US sanctions for around 25 years did not do anything to them. They, they surpassed it. Um, and now, you know, the 2015 uh, um, Iran uh, policy for not having nuclear weapons uh, gave them uh, a lot of money. And when that was stopped, the JCPOA uh, that was stopped, uh, they, they, um, the resolution was 2231. So to again return those sanctions, UN sanctions, and to prohibit Iran from making a nuclear capable ballistic missile was uh, put into place. But Jay, what did they do? They started developing the Shahid drones and started supplying Russia and the Ukraine conflict. And uh, Jay, uh, see the amount of money that they put in, around $16 billion to perk up the Assad regime in Syria. Around $700 million supplied annually to Hezbollah in a non-conflict time. We cannot, we have not been able to calculate how much they have supplied to the current uh, conflict that is happening in Israel-Palestine. And when they call uh, Palestine as the heart of the Muslim community, they just see what they want to do. They want to be a regional power and the head of the Muslim world. But uh, see, there is on the other end of the spectrum, there's a country like Saudi Arabia, which has uh, diverted its politics to being an uh, open society. They are making Islam more liberal, more advanced. They are trying to become a, uh, what do you say? A com he he uh, aims, Salman aims at uh, being an open society like Europe while maintaining the Islamic structure. So you see that is, and he, he competes in development for at the G20 level. He wants to make Saudi Arabia one of the fastest growing uh, countries. He's that, he, he wants to, become a regional power, and he's working towards it. Iran wants to be a regional power, but the rhetoric is more than the action. That is the difference between these two countries, if you take, compared to Islamic countries in the Middle East, yeah, this is the difference that happens between them. And that is where Iran loses out. And Jay, domestically, women rights, big issue. Ethnic rights, big issue. Ethnic religious rights, big issue. There are negligible number of Jews, Zoroastrians, Baha'i people in uh, uh, Iran. There are uh, and uh, zero tolerance for LGBTQ community. So uh, how can they adjust to the international scenario where there is a lot of acceptance of diversity? So they are a closed society, Jay, and they want to impose it around them. Ro rogue is not a strong enough word. Pariah, maybe pariah, maybe a, a better word. So, um, you know, what about its uh, relations now? Um, for example, you know, we know that the BRIC conference is going to take place in Russia, which is very disturbing because uh, Russia is also a rogue country in a place called Kazan, Russia. And although, although this is very interesting, although Iran is not a member of BRIC, and we'll talk about this next week. Although Iran is not a member of BRIC, it's going to be there. 
And that means, you know, it is anti-US, it is pro-Russia, it is pro-China, and arguably pro-India. Um, Brazil, I don't think is relevant to this discussion, but, you know, query, what, what are they trying to do in their foreign policy? They're at odds with Saudi Arabia because it's much too Western for them. It's also Sunni as opposed to Shiite, because Shiite is where, you know, Iran lives and talk about the clash of civilization. I think that's what you've been talking about, mm -hmm. the clash of civilizations. And so, you know, their foreign policy is it, beyond just being um, a terror organization and arranging all these terror proxies. They are engaged in an active diplomatic effort um, against the United States, against the West. Uh, what's that about? Yeah, Jay, uh, Iran is, uh, what do you say? Iran is right now uh, in the bad books of India because they spoke about the uh, attention of the Muslim uh, ulema against the atrocities committed against Muslims. So India's MEA, the Ministry of External Affairs, gave a befitting uh, reply that look into your uh, own domestic problems before you point fingers at anybody else. And the minorities are living very peacefully in India. So that was the reply, prompt reply that the uh, Ministry of External Affairs gave in uh, Iran. And Jay, um, their, their stand of being pro-Russia, um, anti-US, that Iran is not a very loyal friend. So uh, Jay, keeping that in mind, uh, they do not have loyalty for their own religion because they are, like you said, they are Shia but they support the Sunni Hezbollah. Why? Because their target is Israel. So uh, for them, loyalties are very fickle. And uh, they don't have these set prerogatives like we speak about the strategic partnership between India and Russia. They, they want to keep that loyalty. Israel and uh, uh, America, they keep that loyalty. It's intact, irrespective of the ups and downs or irrespective of the speed breakers, Jay, there's an underlying uh, uh, bond of friendship and uh, being an ally. With Iran, what happens? They don't keep it. They don't keep this loyalty and they, uh, they change directions as per their uh, immediate benefits. So, uh, Jay, they attending the BRICS and uh, they being pro-Russia. Russia has had so many problems with Iran, but just because it is anti-US right now and supplying lots of drones, uh, it's coming to the good books of Russia. But I don't think Russia will ever trust Iran blindly anytime. Yeah, well, you know, you can't trust an autocracy. I'm sorry. No. You can't trust either an autocracy or a theocracy because they go the way the wind blows. Now, so, you know, I want to I want to ask you, you know, what are the prospects here? I mean, this this used to be a great empire uh, for hundreds of years, and until uh, I'd say until the the uh, what is it seventh or eighth century when they uh, adopted uh, Islam, um, they were a notable empire, um, but no more. They they used to have uh, art and architecture and writing uh, and uh, mathematics and science even. But they sort of gave that up. Now, I'm not saying that Iran doesn't know about technology. It does. It makes the Shahid drone, and that is a piece of technology. Uh, it's making atomic bombs. That's a piece of technology. Um, but they're not known for that. Um, they're not known on the world stage for being an advanced country. They're no longer an empire. There's something else. And my question to you is, you know, do you see a time uh, this is this is the operative question of the discussion. <clears throat> Do you see a time when they could be a, a friendly nation in the family of nations? Do you see a time when the people of Iran would rise up and, and uh, you know change things? Do you see a time uh, when they would change their mm, loyalty, uh, when they would change their diplomatic relations, uh, where they would find a way to join the family of nations, including the Western family of nations? Or is that something that's too far in the future to consider? Uh, second option, Jay, too far in the future to consider at all. Because, uh, Jay, it's a theocratic society, and the theocratic elite 
are so uh, hard-handed and they control the finance, they control the resources and their mismanagement is at such top-notch uh, levels that uh, according to one of the UN reports, 96% of the population did not have access to clean water also. Imagine uh, Iran being a good, uh, it's got good geographical uh, extent, but uh, drinking water was inaccessible. Agricultural uh, prospects are very weak, uh, bleak in uh, Iran. So uh, this kind of mismanagement is what? For what? To keep the domestic population poor, to keep the uh, to keep them because see the religious elite control the oil money. They have a lot of money. They don't want this money to trickle down to uh, the domestic population. They don't want the development to reach the. Uh, lowest level like how you see uae has developed uh dubai and you know you have the local population coming in you have the um uh, immigration that happens you have expats who come in and work and contribute to the economy it becomes you the local population enjoys the benefits of a developed society due to petrodollars that doesn't happen in in, in iran iran keeps its population famine famished and uh, you know you don't have only you know few tourist spots or uh, the old historical places but what has been the development are there good skyscrapers are there good uh, is there good infrastructure no there are villages there are a couple of uh, cities persia was supposed to be an empire a civilization it could have developed into one of the best most developed countries of the world but that does not happen because you want development uh, resources to stay in the hands of the elite rather than come to uh, the benefit of the population. And J in Iran, there's an underground movement for everything, for uh, practicing your religion if you are of a different religion, practice, uh, you know, hearing your music if you want to hear some other different uh, music. You have uh, this uh, alcohol which is being served, which is underground. You know, all these things happen uh, the LGBTQ uh, community is not in the open. Uh, so the, they have two levels of society operating in Iran. And that is, Jay, we, and because of the sanctions and nobody wants to go near it and uh, disturb it, you do whatever you want within your doors. That is why the elite keep on getting stronger. The domestic population comes with an uprising. Now this Mahesa 2022 uprising was huge. What happens? It gets squashed because the um, police, the local police, that is known as the moral police, they call it. The moral police is so strong at uh, uh, confining these uh, uprisings, Jay, that they literally, uh, death is just another word there. It doesn't matter for them how many people die, how many people, uh, what age people die, they just disappear. There is no oh. appeal against the religious elite. Sounds awful. It sounds like a place you'd never, ever want to go. You know, there was a time, I suppose, during the, the Shah's reign when there was much greater discourse with the United States, but that's over. It's 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 replaced by this strange, inexplicable hatred, pariah hatred. But let me ask you about um, the technology. How did they get involved in the, uh, in the missile business? How did they get involved in the Shahid uh, uh, drone business? That's pretty sophisticated, and uh, it's having an effect in Ukraine. Uh, what's that about? What's that from? What's Where is that going? Jay, technology is uh, well-developed in Iran because, like we spoke, when uh, they were very close to developing a nuclear-capable uh, uh, um, warhead, but then when the uh, restrictions came in, they started moving towards the Shahid drones and... Uh, uh, Jay, uh, cybersecurity, we talk about, they're one of the biggest threats to cybersecurity in the world. They have had multiple attacks on the US, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Qatar systems. So uh, Iran doesn't fall back in this zone of technology, at least. They do have a lot of inventions and they use it to bad effect every and each time. And uh, Jay, you see uh, the, um, the control, the area from the Persian Gulf to the Red Sea. So the Navy also, when they are, um, they sabotage the cargo ships with mines. So they have very uh, destructive uses of their technological advancements. 
uh, we saw that they had uh, the recent attack that we discussed. They had sent 100 drones uh, coming to Israel. But how many of them landed actually? They could be intercepted. So uh, Jay, they don't have this, uh, even their planes, Jay, the, the air, uh, air flight, uh, fleet is not upgraded. You know that, no? Because of the sanctions that are on them. They have these old planes and they rent out planes from Turkey. So they don't have a good um, um, airline functioning in Iran. So they have these plane crashes many, many times that you hear in the news. It's because they have this, uh, um, they have not been able to upgrade their uh, flight systems. So uh, JC, uh, they can manufacture Shahid drones, but they cannot uh, afford to or um, concentrate on upgrading their domestic flights and international flights. So see where they concentrate and divert their resources and manpower. It's always towards the destructive. Weapons. You know, it's, it's like uh, Hamas. In fact, Hamas is their agent. Uh, yeah. They're spreading this, this cheer everywhere. Hamas and Hezbollah and the Houthis and so forth. But I want to ask you a hypothetical question, you know. When Trump got in office, first thing he did was reversed um, Barack Obama's effort, his treaty, if you will, with uh, Iran, which may or may not have been a positive practical treaty, but uh, at least theoretically, it was supposed to slow down Iran's uh, you know, creation, purification of uranium for bombs. Um, and of course, when, he, uh, when Trump uh, backed out of that, um, then Iran could go ahead and, you know, work on its nuclear bombs. Uh, where does that put us? If Trump gets back into office, will that help? Uh, if uh, this is a hard question, I know. Uh, if uh, Kamala Harris gets into office, will that help? Um, is it possible for us to have a denouement uh, with with Iran, where they they stop making bombs, or are they going to make bombs no matter what? Rupmati, your thoughts? Jay, what happened with uh, Iran was when they when Russia bypassed the sanctions and they started dealing with their oil and gas and you know going via the other refineries to supply to the countries which they were not supposed to. Iran has joined it. Iran has joined it and also uh, used uh, these same routes to uh, um, supply their own uh, oil and gas and petrol, and they are earning the petrodollars through the black market. Uh, a region and they are getting their money and pumping it into Hamas and Hezbollah. So, Jay, whoever comes into power, red or blue, uh, they have to keep an eye on Iran because uh, because of being the main sponsor of terrorism. And we know when terrorism uh, um, you you let it thrive in another region on another part of the planet, eventually, sometime it's going to come to this soil and hurt. Uh, our domestic population for no rhyme or reason. So to nip it in the bud is the best uh, policy, Jay. And anybody who comes to power has to make sure that the rogue state is well treated. Because see, Jay, they have not uh, held back in supplying uh, Hamas and Hezbollah to extent of millions of dollars, millions. And uh, you see these people who are living in tunnels for them, a million dollar also means so much. So equipment, if you cut this supply, how will the Hamas and Hezbollah uh, survive? So this um, war of attrition that you talk about, that will get a halt, a pause, only if you uh, cut this funding. Any any operation needs to cut the funding. Well, it's, it's all about money. And that's one of the issues at BRICS, um, the question of whether to use gold instead of U.S. dollars. I knew that was going to happen one day. But let, let's go back to a hypothetical then. Just suppose, all things considered, uh, that Iran can create bombs. I mean, some people think they got bombs now. Um, but let's say they become a notable, well-known nuclear power in the Middle East. Uh, that is terrifying because they, they have no good, no good mm, sensibilities. They're only into weapons destruction, all the worst human traits. That's what we got. Uh, so query, what happens if they get to be not only a rogue state, but a nuclear rogue state? How scary is that? 
very, very scary prospect. Okay? We have nuclear powers in the world, but each one has been a responsible nuclear power. And secondly, the nuclear weapons that were acquired by the current nuclear holding people were used as a deterrence against uh, their adversary who has already had nuclear powers. So either used as deterrence, even by Russia and US in uh, the Cold War, it was stockpiling of nuclear warheads because to act as deterrence. So deterrence was a very important word in the nuclear uh, world. But Jay, why we fear that Iran should not get a nuclear weapon is because they have clearly, categorically, in black and white, written in stone, said that they want to use the nuclear weapons to wipe Israel off the map. So that is the biggest reason why we have to not allow uh, Iran to take a nuclear weapon because they want that one chance to uh, attack Israel. So they want to, uh, that, that goal that they think of uh, wiping off the Zionist uh, uh, Israel, uh, they call it, it's not right because see, it's venomous. And uh, we have missiles and we have cruise, uh, cru uh, ballistic missiles in the hands of the Hamas and Hezbollah causing so much havoc. Imagine a nuclear warhead in the hands of Iran. Will they stop? They will never. So, uh, and who will come to help? That is the main point. We have seen two big conflicts happen. Israel, Russia, Ukraine, Israel, uh, uh, Hamas attack on Israel. Who came to help? So at that point, when uh, Iran launches a nuclear weapon, who will come to help? So that's why, Jay, it, has, it is a no compromise situation. Absolutely no compromise. They cannot have nuclear weapons because their target is something which is very well defined and very, very, very destructive. You know, I hadn't thought about that. The fact is that nobody came to help. Nobody came uh, to help no. uh, Ukraine. There were no boots on the ground from other nations. Money, maybe. Weapons, maybe. Delayed weapons. Thank you, Joe Biden. Um, and in Israel, nobody came to help the IDF. Maybe money, maybe weapons, but nobody actually came. No boots on the ground even though this is obviously an effort by Iran to destroy Israel. It's just long-term mission. And destroying Israel means destroying the West, destroying the U.S., uh, making all of the region uh, Islamic. That's what they want. That's, that's their ultimate mission. Uh, whether their people want that or not, that's what the country wants. So I guess uh, uh, it's interesting, and I would like to ask you about it, um, you know, what about the relationship of Ali Khomeini, uh, the uh, theocratic leader of Iran, and the newly elected president, Pazeshkian, uh, who is right now in New York at the United Nations making rhetoric? Um, what's the relationship? Um, when we talked before the show, we concluded it was good cop, bad cop. Uh, can, can, you tell, can you tell how that works? Who's the good cop? Who's the bad cop? And how are they playing this out? Yeah, Jay, when the previous president died, died in a helicopter crash, this was this uh, election that took place, 40% voting, which is kind of the lowest turnout that happened uh, in uh, Iran. And uh, Pzeskian came into power. So uh, he was portrayed as a democracy-loving, anti-hijab, uh, uh, anti, what do you say, um, uh, uh, terror activities kind of a person. So what they portrayed him to be a liberal president. And that's what happens in Iranian politics, Jay. Uh, it's a theocratic society. So you have to give the people a little rope to hang their neck into. So they give this uh, president who uh, seems to be very liberal, very uh, uh, freedom loving and soft uh, hearted. He is under the supreme leader of the Islamic Republic of Iran, which is Ali Khomeini, and he cannot move an eyelid without the uh, without the permission of the uh, dictator. So, what is the use? This is just to show the people, oh, we have given you your choice of a uh, person, and see, he is a good person. He is liberal. He works for you. But in fact, he is not. He is under the boots of Ali Khomeini. So, Jay, what an uh, imbalance that they bring in. And like you said, it's the good cop, bad cop uh, um, concept that they bring in. 
uh, they don't really care about the people. They don't. Uh, he is not going to come to revolutionize the uh, Iranian society. He is not going to come to democratize the Iranian society. No person is going to get freedom through him. <laughs> How much ever he speaks, they will not discontinue the support that they have for Hamas and Hezbollah. It will continue with more vigor. And he has to be just, uh, what do you say, uh, uh, just a face, a front. But the real strings are always in the hands of the religious leader. It's a theocratic society. You know, you talk about autocrats always lie. They do. Dictators always lie to get to where they want to go. They don't care about telling the truth. They, they don't care about moral conduct. Um, and of course, theocrats are autocrats, and they lie. So here's Pazeshkian in New York at the United Nations, and he's uh, he, he many people have asked him, um, is um, is Iran going to retaliate against Israel for what it is doing to Hezbollah right now in Lebanon because it is it is attacking Lebanon, and uh, so the, the question and he says in response he says it's not the right time for that. We want peace. We don't want war. Uh, we're going to hold up, and we're not going to follow through in our our premise, our threat to retaliate against Israel right now. So my my question to you is: Is he telling the truth? What? Why would they hold up? What do you think they will do? Are they? What are they waiting for to retaliate as they promised they would? Jay, they lie on the uh, big stage also, as they do on domestic. Uh, uh, politics. They do lie even at the UN forum. And uh, Jay, what's keeping them, I feel, uh, personal uh, perspective is that what a showdown they had last time when, you know, you had Jordan and Saudi Arabia also lining up again under the British uh, and the US forces to thwart the uh, attack on Israel. And they lost, they lost it. Uh, only five or six uh, reached Israel. So they lost uh, um, uh, confrontation that they thought that they would really hurt Israel with. Now they want to be sure of how they attack, but they are wary of it because uh, when they're going to attack or if they attack this time, they want it to be very effective. And they know that America will always stand in front of Israel. Even India is supplying uh, drones uh, by the plenty to Israel almost monthly, weekly, whatever you say, helping Israel. So India and Iran being a strong allies before, but India has supported Israel in this uh, Hamas conflict. So that makes Iran into a very, uh, what do you say? It's a very precarious situation that it has because even its old allies have left Jordan, Saudi Arabia, India, all have sided Israel against Iran. So uh, it doesn't have, it has to go solo with Lebanon, Syria, uh, Pal uh, who else? You know, uh, uh, Egypt is refusing to come in because right now people are in a recess recession mode after the pandemic and nobody wants to get into a war to cut you back economically. Jay. So uh, general action is that we don't want to get into your fight. And they came up with such big words that you came to hurt our guest in uh, in our uh, territory. Mm -hmm. But they could not retaliate on it because they don't have um, the guts to go for another flop show. So um, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to make you Secretary of State again, Rupmati. <laughs> I always feel you'd be a great Secretary of State. Now, remember that... Um, you know, that uh, Hezbollah has been attacking Israel and it's costed 10 or 20 miles at the northern border. Everybody had to evacuate. They were sending so many missiles uh, into Israel. Um, and I don't think that has sufficient press. For some reason, the, the press hasn't covered that as the way it should have. And then, of course, uh, you know, we have certain nostalgic pieces about the killing of hundreds of U.S. Marines in Lebanon um, back when by Hezbollah, by the same people. Um, and that really should affect American foreign policy with regard to Hezbollah and Lebanon. So and this is complicated, isn't it? We have Iran with the proxies, with the terror. We have Lebanon, whose people have been compromised pretty much in the same way that the Palestinians have been compromised in Gaza. Um, and, and now the question is, what should the United States do? If the United States cannot protect Israel, the whole thing changes. 
the calculus around the Middle East and probably the world will change. So we have to be mindful of that. We have to be mindful of the existential risk that Iran presents, not only to Israel, but to the whole region. So query you as the Secretary of State, what do you do now? And let's not worry about the change or the, 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 the new administration coming in next year. Let's make you a sustainable Secretary of State. You're there. You make or recommend policy. What do you do? Jay, uh, if you look at the religious map of uh, the world, you see Israel just is a small speck in the entire green zone. And, uh, okay, if you make a democracy uh, uh, map, Israel is still a small speck in that uh, zone. So it's so important for the world and it's so important for the U.S. itself to have an ally in uh, Israel. One of our shows, we discussed what give and take we have as mutual uh, uh, friends. And also it is very uh, natural to be friends with Israel uh, as an ally, Jay. So as a sustainable uh, ally, no, uh, it's it's uh, formidable uh, connections that we have. Now, Jay, when Iran wants to uh, hurt Israel, uh, US comes forward and should come forward and will always come forward because Jay, it will spread after today the target of iran is israel tomorrow after if if god forbid they think that they can finish it you think the next target will not be something else they uh, the theocracy especially the islamic theocracy has a political agenda it's the only religion in the world which has a political agenda christianity spread but it never went it had a political agenda to establish governments. But uh, the Islamic theocracy has a political agenda. When there is conflict, you keep quiet. When there is peace, you start struggling. When you feel you're superior, you have to establish. That is the three-stage uh, development of Islamic political ideology. And you see any country, you pick up the politics of any country, it is that, what they follow. Uh, they, when they are now today, Iran uh, is in a zone of peace and quiet because they're not able, they're, they're, they're gathering themselves. Tomorrow, if they were in a, uh, suppose the Iran was in a position like the US, a strong position, you think they would have waited? They would not. They would have used their entire power to achieve their goals. What happens with our societies, Jay? We wait. We, we we think we have a perspective that is formed. We try to uh, negotiate. But when these countries get a chance, they will never, ever leave a point to hack uh, for, uh, uh, for achieving their goals. Jay. That's the difference between a uh, uh, civilized society and a theocratic society. Jay. I call it uncivilized because really, it does not have manners in dealing with in, on the international stage. They do not have rules that they follow. They do not have, uh, what do you say? They do not have uh, morals. They do not have respect for life. Suicide missions are, they think about the afterlife. And the democratic societies, the civilized societies, the humane people think about saving lives, about valuing lives, or valuing even dead bodies, we know. What happened to a soldier's dead body in 2021 when we negotiated for a hostage? So that much respect for life there is. But here, a suicide mission will not be anything. You're thinking of the afterlife. So big end of spectrums that we have. And that's why the paths don't match. It. And so if we get a chance, if we know we need to do, we need to act, we need to act, Jay. There is too much talk, less action going on. And in that, that zone which we have stretched, where there is less action, lots of lives are being lost. You're so right. We've covered a lot of ground today, Rupmati, and thank you very much for educating us about so many things today. I look forward to our next discussion. Aloha, Ajay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.